welcome back listeners to Learning From Friends. It's a pleasure to have you come in here today with us. I am your tour guide, Cade Curtis. So as you all know, with the usual start off for every episode is I will pick a quote from my mother in order to start us off with the beautiful part of the day. And I felt this one was very appropriate to use for our guest today because it kind of fits in a little bit to a little bit about who he is. So the quote of today comes from Brooke Hampton. It goes, I like old bookstores. The smell of coffee brewing, rainy day naps, farmhouse porches, and sunsets. I like the sweet, simple things that remind me that life doesn't have to be complicated to be beautiful. Great quote, Mom, for sending that in here to us. So a little bit here, some information about our guest today. With the episode today, I'm speaking with John McMurray, who is basically a jack of all trades here. He's an auctioneer. He's an eBay seller. He has multiple antique booths that now he actually owns an antique store that he's going to tell us about, Antique Market. And he's the master of this kind of side hustle. And one of the coolest things here is actually he's a former president of the GAA, which is the Georgia Auctioneers Association. So we're going to kind of peek behind the curtain here a little bit to learn about all these different little side hustles that he has done that you may have considered yourself in the past or that you know a friend that does that. And you're like, how, how do you do this? This doesn't make sense to me. So maybe this will give you some clarity and kind of a longer little thing than a five minute YouTube video or a one page article. John, it's an honor to have you come on to Learning From Friends. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Kate. Thanks for having me. Can you paint us a visual picture for our listeners? Because 99.8%, there's a 2.2% that you know, know who you are, that who is John McMurray? Well, I was born in Tennessee, grew up in Texas. So I'm a Texas boy at heart. And luckily enough, I met my wife in college. We got married not long after college, actually two weeks after we graduated college. Oh, wow. Didn't wait no time. Oh, no. We'd already been dating two and a half years, so it was time to get married. And then I went to work, and then we got transferred across the country from Texas to California, to Texas, to Georgia, to Delaware, to Georgia. And then that's finally when we decided we're done moving. (laughs) So I am a... Christian, first and foremost, a father. I guess I would say a loving husband. I hope my wife would say that. We'll let her make a comment later. Yeah, she probably would. But also, you know, Friday night football, high school football. That is our date night every every night in the fall. Even though our kids do not care about high school football, (laughs) I've got a senior this year, but he has never been to. He's been to one football game because we made him go with the promise of Chick Fil A. Ooh, okay, incentives. Yeah. So we are big Creek View fans. We go to every game. We don't miss it, no matter what even if it's raining. That is our passion. But I would say my biggest passion right now is for the auction industry in itself. That would be my passion outside of, you know, my faith and family and friends that I I am most interested in. So that's a little bit about me, Cade. That's a a beautiful picture you've painted there. And before coming into auctioneering, uh, what, what was kind of like your role before that? Didn't you work for Honda, wasn't it? Or some big car company? So yeah, I worked for Honda Finance Corporate when I did all those moves. And so when I left after almost 20 years of corporate world, the big, the big scuttlebutt going around the office is what other company is he going to? They didn't realize. And and I told them though, that I was going out on my own. I wanted to start my own auction house. I wanted to do this and that. And and nobody believed me to this day. They, I don't think they still believe (laughs) me. I I worked there for 20 years, great company to work for great benefits. um, But would I go back? The answer is no. There you go. Are you a lot happier now from having kind of stepped away and become your own boss? Becoming your own boss has been great. The pay has decreased, <laughs> but you know, there's no stress. True. As to, unless it's self-imposed. And I say that because, you know, I'd, I'd be at dinner with my family and I get a call from my boss and saying, Hey, did you see this? We got an issue up in Michigan, for example. Well, then John gets on a plane the next morning going to Michigan. Uh, And so there's none of that. I control everything. So we had an issue where our house, the water pressure in the house spiked and blew out the filter in our refrigerator. Ooh. Ooh. Well, it happened to be before my son's, my oldest son's senior year. And so they told us we needed to move out of the house because they had to redo the floors and sand and all that kind of stuff. They had to redo the whole first floor because of the hardwood floors. 
we took a two-week vacation. Oh, nice. And so we traveled to Missouri in Kansas because there was a college that he was interested in Kansas going to. And then we went to St. Louis and went to Six Flags. And then we went to Cincinnati and went to the Sign Museum because I'm big into man caves, things that we'll talk about later, I think. But it was a, it was a big road trip and we went to Dollywood and, and, you know, we got to do all that. And that's something I would not have been able to do if I was working a corporate job. That's true. You can take off whenever you feel like because you're choosing to make money or choosing not to make money at that time. But with also some of your side hustles, you're still making money whether you are or not at that point. That's my, just cool my, my shop is open 24-7. <laughs> this is true. It is. That's John McMurray is always open for business. Yeah, that could go multiple ways. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just got to roll with it. How do, how do we know each other? Because, you know, you've jumped around, you've done this. What, what is our connection here? Well, Kate, our connection is, is through benefit auctions, really. Uh, and the first auction I worked with you, I, I remember, you know, it had to have been 2016, give or take. Yeah, sounds about uh, right. Because I moved back here in 20, December 2015. And I knew George from previously when I lived here in Georgia the first time. Shout out to George Franco. The good news auctioneer. The good news auctioneer, yeah. <laughs> George, that'll be $5, by the way. We'll send you the invoice. Yes, we will, both of us. And so George called me, asked me if I could come and help with a benefit, and I showed up, and, and, and you were there. And we did the normal preliminary, hey, how are you, that kind of thing. And then we started talking about the logistics for the sale that night. And then George is up there. He's starting off and blah, blah, blah. And in between items, and I know George already told the name of Dancy Boy, but Dancy Boy came out in full force that night. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, what is he doing? Not realizing the impact that you actually had with the crowd. It's a connection. It's, it it's a connection. Absolutely. And I'm sitting there going, I just turned to one of the ladies and she was looking at like, what is he doing? And I said, ma'am, I have no control over him. I, I This is my first night working with him. I, maybe the last based off his dance moves. But you do cut a rug and yeah. that's, and I, we've probably worked 50 auctions together. Oh, 75 yeah, easily. Since easily. Then. And, and I'm the loud one, I guess. And you're the entertaining one. And you're able to get that extra, like five, ten, hundred thousand dollars out of somebody. And I'm just over there kind of just providing a little bit extra entertainment for yeah. people. We have our roles. We have our roles. And, um, it, I, I think at this point, I think George considers us the A team per se. I'll just put it out there. Sorry, Devon. But, we work good together. We do. We, we can, have a good chemistry. We can communicate without talking to each other across a ballroom. Yeah. We have our hand gestures that we both know. Yeah. That's universal for a lot of people. If you've got a bid, I know that, hey, I may have to come across the room to help you out with another bidder Correct. that may be popped up or you may jump to my side. It's, yeah, chemistry. It, it's chemistry. I mean, we could walk in at an event. The, the auction starts at 730. You and I could walk in at 725. And we know exactly what we're going to do. And we know where the room is. Like we say, okay, hey, there's probably more money over here, or maybe there's more money over there. Correct. I, I don't say it out loud a lot of times, but I, I like my LOLs. I know where my little old ladies are. And I, you know, head that direction. Or hey, this is my connection <laughs> closest, my easiest route to the dance floor. That's kind of where I'll hit it. The other thing I would say, if there's a buffet, Cade knows what's on the buffet. Oh yeah. I'm one of the first people in line. Absolutely. I'm the second usually, but that's one thing we share in common. If there's a buffet, we're going to get a little grub. Oh yeah. And, and one of our funny stories that we share is deals with food. Do you want to share this lovely story? Oh yeah. So we were doing a benefit in downtown Atlanta at a beautiful swanky hotel hotel. And uh, the event had started and there was no place for us to sit, which is, which is not uncommon. We're, we're considered hired help. They usually don't have a place for us to sit. Well, they came up to us and said, well, we have some open seats. Just go ahead and grab a seat. And we're like, okay. So we sat down at a table just trying to fill in the seats. And lo and behold, neither one of us realized this, but we ended up sitting at the VIP table. And I think, Cade, you ate Tyler Perry's meal yeah, and I, I ate his wife's <laughs> meal. So they politely came over and said, gentlemen, you need to move. Tyler Perry's now here. He was running late and we didn't know this. But to give up your seat for Tyler Perry, that was actually okay. But here's a quick fact about Tyler Perry you may or may not know. Okay, shoot it. He actually worked for Honda Finance at one time. What? Prior to me, at the office I ended up being a manager at, prior 
to his success now. He didn't last very long, but he was there for a little bit. Wow. It's the story I heard. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I heard. We'll do some fact check. And Tyler Perry, if you're out there, send us an email and let us know uh, <laughs> uh, if this is a true statement. You can send an email to Cade, which is spelled C-A-D-E at learningfromfriends.com. Uh, if anyone has this information, I would love to hear that as well. If not, we can just, uh, you know, call John out on it saying your stories are fake news. It may be, but that's the story I heard. I love, love those little myths that now start to spur. And maybe I'm going to keep an eye on, you know, Facebook or Twitter and see if your story's spreading here. See if it trends. Exactly. See, see if it trends here. Now let's go into some of these topics today because we've got a couple different ones that we're going to hit on, specifically talking about, you know, auctioneering, eBay, and your antique booths, which has now turned into your own little market that you've purchased here. What are some misconceptions that people tend to have with selling on eBay, auctioneering, being a booth seller that you kind of want to respond to a little bit? Well, I think, think for the biggest part in the auction industry itself, the biggest misconception is that it's a distress sale. You have your estate auctions where somebody has passed away and, and you're liquidating the entire estate. But if you look at the auction industry as a whole, you have all sorts of different types of auctions. You have benefit auctions, you have cattle auctions, you have car auctions, you have personal property auctions. But if you, if you look at some of the news, I think just recently I saw an article this morning that a Super V car oh wow sold for 1.62 million okay that only happens when you get into the auction method of marketing yes okay because an auctioneer is going to promote that they're gonna it drives competition it wasn't a distress sale of that car they could put it up for five hundred thousand and it would have sold relatively quickly but when you create that environment that people actually get competitive with. Oh yeah. Then they, they want that item. And, and so I, I think the, the biggest misconception is in the, in the auction industry again, is that people think it's always going to be some type of distress and you know, they're just trying to liquidate it and you're only going to get pennies on the dollar or something like that. While that may be true in some situations, I have also seen a porthole, a brass porthole in my own personal auction sell for $300. Wow. I almost didn't take it in on consignment because I didn't think it was going to bring $10, but it brought 300 or a license plate. that was a 1913 New Orleans two digit porcelain license plate. City of New Orleans issued license plates back here. It sold for $1,800. Wow. The lady offered it to me at $300 and I told her, no, I said, I'll put it in the auction. It'll bring more money for you that way. She was very happy with that. I, I would as well. Yeah. I would as well. So I, I think when, when you talk about eBay, I, I think you see some misconceptions there. Maybe that, it, you know, it may be just this person in their basement selling five items at a time, give or take. There are people that that is their full-time job is, you know, going out, getting items, putting them on eBay, and that pays their entire livelihood. And I think some people just don't realize that they could do that. Yeah, there's a lot that can be done to it, especially if you have your own niche in the market. Your own niche in your market, but as with anything, the harder you work, the greater the reward, right? Yes, very much so. You, you know, so if, if you're out there and you're, you know, as we call it, picking, um, picking up, you know, items or something like that, then you can make good money, but you've got to put time and effort into it. You got to put your gas mileage, you got to put your time in, you got to be, you know, doing retail arbitrage, which is you know, going to TJ Maxx and getting a shirt that's on clearance for $5, turning around and selling it for $25. A lot of people do that. Yeah. And there's YouTube videos galore. I will never do a YouTube video because all they're doing is showing people how to you make money. You're competition. It's competition. Well, it's, it's not only your competition, but you're showing the IRS. Oh, that's true. Yeah. You Taxes. Know. Well, and I look at it, you know, I, I know that there, I'm, I, I'm a toy guy, Cade. I think you know that a little bit yeah. about me. I, I am big into toys and Tonkas and Smith Miller toys and Hot Wheels and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But if I'm out there showing people what to look for, that decreases the market for me. That is very true. So why sell my quote unquote company secrets or trade secrets? But, but I'm willing to do that for you today, Cade. Everybody has a price. That's right. <laughs> 
I'll set the invoice later. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course. <laughs> so let's go into the auctioneering portion because that's where it kind of started from. And I mm-hmm. guess in a way, what made you decide to become an auctioneer? Because working for Honda, like what's the connection here? Well, I was working for Honda and my wife and I bought our first house about a year, year and a half after we got married. And back in Texas, you know, we had a four bedroom house that we bought and it was like a hundred thousand dollar house, right? Hundred twenty five thousand dollar house. Houses back then were a lot cheaper than they are today. Oh, entirely. And I'm dating myself because this is 1999. Okay. And so my wife and I, we moved into our house. We moved from a two bedroom apartment to a four bedroom house with a living room and a kitchen and you know, all the stuff we didn't have. Well, we had a kitchen, but you know what I mean? And so we were talking about what are we going to do to fill this, you know, to make it where we can enjoy every room and, and all that and have a guest room. And, and so I used to like to sit down and read the Sunday paper. When you open up the Sunday paper back then, it was the Fort Worth star telegram. And on the back page of the classified section was the auction schedule or oh, auction page. Nice. That's the, and so I looked at it and I was like, Hey, here's one, you know, 10 miles away next Saturday. Let's go. My wife looked at me and said, sure, let's go. And so we go to this auction and it's the first time we'd ever been to an auction, never been to one before. And it was like an estate auction, but they had additional consignments because apparently the estate had a furniture store too. Connections. Yeah. Between Connections. Yeah. yeah. So, the, so they made it all into one large auction and there was a desk my wife wants. And of course, whatever the wife wants, the wife gets. True statements. Happy wife, happy life. Right. I've learned that in one year of marriage. Doesn't matter what I want. And I bet that's made a very much easier life. It's 24 years as of, you know, May of this year. Congratulations. No, thanks kid. So this desk has a $1,300 price tag on it. (coughs) And I'm sitting there going, we're not spending $1,300 on a, on a desk. Well, the auctioneer gets up there, starts out 1,300,000, 500, 250, hundred dollars. Finally, they dropped down to $50. Somebody else bid. I turned to my wife and said, you want to do 60? She goes, sure. $60. No further bids. Sold $60. 1300 to 60 To 60 And like I said, this is a distressed situation, as I kind of mentioned in, in, in this situation. So we just bought a desk for 60 bucks. And I turned to my wife and said, I can give stuff away. I could do that. I have no problem speaking in front of a crowd. I've done it, you know. And so... That's what planted the seed for me to learn about it. Uh, well, in 2001, I got transferred to California. 2002, I got transferred back. And then in 2003, that's when I went to auction school and learned how to do the auction chant and all that kind of stuff. Where did you go to auction school at? I went to what is called the Texas Auction Academy, but is now known as America's Auction Academy because they have multiple locations throughout the U.S., and how long are you in school for to become an auctioneer? Because a lot of people don't think about that. Wait, I have to go to school to get a license and to do all this to become an auctioneer. Well, Texas is very similar to Georgia. Texas is uh, 82 hours. You have to pass a criminal background check. You have to pass a state exam. You have to pass a school exam first, then get to get approved out of the school. Then, then your state exam, your background check. Of course, every state wants a fee. Oh yeah. You know, and so, and just like here in Georgia, it's administered by the secretary of state's office in in the state of Texas. So all that to be said, to learn how to call numbers and do the number drills and, and, and learn how to, to do all that intrinsic stuff of being an auctioneer. Yeah. And you really got to, they give you a little bit of understanding as well as how does the finance work? How can you be able to write a little bit of your contracts and stuff as well? Well, back then it was, how to write a classified ad for the newspaper. That was how marketing. Yeah, it it was, that was, that was the marketing point. Now it's nowadays, of course, it's all Facebook ads, right? Or online ads, or we don't really use print anymore. Yeah. Few and far between. Very few and far between. So, I mean, it was, it was a lot different time back then. And I say that now because I'm, I'm almost 50. God, that sounds really old, but yeah, it was, it was different back then on what you would do, but the auctioneer school, you know, I I was watching the 30th anniversary of my auction school this year and they had a class fun auction 
And before they did anything, they said, all right, everybody, let's warm up. And they started the number drills. And I found myself going along with them doing the number <laughs> drills. And I didn't even realize I was doing it until my wife comes in and goes, what are you doing? And I turned, oh, I said, I'm, I'm warming up. She goes, for what? I said, nothing. I'm just practicing. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I practice in the shower before we're going or I'll get in the car when I'm driving somewhere just to keep it in place because if, if you don't use it, you lose it, as they say. What I, what I found on the interstate was I'll use the cars that either pass me or I'm passing because, you know, I'm not always in the fast lane. Right, Kate? Oh, um, no, no. You're, you're, you're five miles an hour below the speed limit. That's right, Kate. You stay um, in the slow lane and make sure that everybody can pass you, including the little old ladies. Yes, because they're on the way to the event for you. It's, exactly. They have to. And so... Or bingo. You know? Yeah, exactly. So when as cars are passing me, I might be selling the car sitting right in front of me. But as people are passing me, maybe going the opposite way, that's a bid. That way it's it's not always the same interval or anything like that. Or you got light post or you can do whatever you want. It's just a matter of keeping the tempo. flow yeah. and the tempo and the, and the enunciation going. Yeah, heavily because if you don't have that, people are not going to know where you're at, what's going on. Do you, do you have any filler words that you like to use? Would you bid? Would you bid? Would you bid? Yeah, that, that's kind of, you know, because I'm at... 25, 50, now 75, would you bid 75? Now 75, 75, would you bid 75? 100 now, 1 quarter, 150, 175, 200. So that, that's, would you bid? Because I was doing another auction and, or helping out at a f- auction in Texas and it had like four or five auctioneers. It was that big of an estate. Wow. And I was, I was green, Cade. I mean, I was probably a month out of auction school. Just okay. gotta get practice on I gotta get your reps. And... You know, it was getting towards the end. I'd been ringing and they finally said, Hey, John, you want to, you want to sell a little bit? And I said, absolutely. You know, let me, let me try. And after the sale, one of the auctioneers who is actually NAA champion, National Auctioneers Association. Yeah. Bid calling champion. His wife is a bid calling champion. He, he came to me and said, your filler word. And I don't even remember what it was. Your filler words sound like you're begging for bids. Ooh. He said, change it to something else. He gave me a couple options and I chose, would you bid? Because it, it, it was, it just flowed better. And the fact that it wasn't, you know, and I take, I took that message to heart. And I, I think in the auction industry, okay, you may or may not agree with this. I, I think it's one of those industries where, yeah, we're competitors, but we will help each other out. Oh, entirely. I, I'm all for that one. We work for different companies from time to time. Yeah. And we just get called in and I've been a sub for when someone's sick and it goes, Hey, come in. And there's been time where I've taken zero money because of, I'm just wanting to help you out and that's paying it forward. And people look at that and go, okay, he's a good person. Or if I sell something in broke a rule, auctioneers are going to say, nope, I don't like that auctioneer now because of, and it makes my, the auctioneer business look bad. So you can word travels. Abs- absolutely. Now, you actually own your own auction house. Yes. What is the name of this auction house, and how did that name come to play? Because it's, it's a funny name. Well, in the, in the auction industry, it's, it's kind of standard to have your Cade Curtis Auctions. Yes. Which is the name of your company. Is that correct? It is. It is. Okay. So that, that is the standard. Well, I have a business partner, Randy, and so we were not going to name it John and Randy's Auction. We wanted to do something different and something memorable. So... I'm sitting at my kitchen table across from me is my wife and I'm, and we're going back and forth texting between myself, my wife, Randy and his lovely wife, Libby names, just trying to, we're like, Oh, first mountain auction or first city auction or cause we're based out of Jasper at the time of this recording. And so I looked over to my wife and she, she, she had more of a thinking face on, but she had her arms crossed and was kind of, you know, twisted the the lip like, you know, you see in the Olympic meme, the Michaela, I, oh, I can't think of it, Maroney, yes, you know yes. what I'm saying? She had that like thinking face going on. And so I finally just said, angry mama's auctions. And to a T, everybody agreed on that right then, right there. That was the name because we got to thinking about the marketing aspects of that. Okay. We're different. Yes. We're, we're separating our name out there. People like it. We had t-shirts. We sold t-shirts. And our wives would get angry with us at times because both of us are collectors as well. Our home has become a collection of, of different stuff. 
And so I'd bring home a, a, a load of toys and she'd be like, what are you going to do with that now? And so some of it go on eBay. Some of it I keep for my personal collection, right? And so that became the running joke of why Angry Mamas came to be. Mm. And so not only do we have Angry Mamas auctions, now we have Angry Mamas Antiques and Interiors, which is our antique mall incoming. That's a great investment too, diversifying your funds here. Well, but you think about an antique store, a lot of our customers in the auction are currently dealers at the antique store. Yeah, because they're buying some of the stuff from you to be able to take and put in their booths or sell elsewhere because they're buying low and selling high, a reseller. Right. Or if it's a dealer that, hey, you know, I'm retiring, I'm moving to Florida, here, sell all my stuff. We can sell it in the booth or we can put it over in the auction. It's a... Two different divisions of the antique industry, because we kind of focus on collectibles, you know, anything you see on American Pickers. However, we did get very tired of people coming in saying, hey, you should call American Pickers, because we put up a sign that basically said, if you mention American Pickers, you owe us a $2 fine. Oh, wow. Well, it became it just because we'd have, you know, porcelain signs and Coca-Cola and all this other kind of stuff. You should call Frank. No, that's what we do. Yeah, this we're not American Pickers. We are our own separate entity. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And you specifically said, like, at one point, like, signs and stuff. What is your niche really in that market for selling at your auction? Our, our niche varies. You know, like, I have a contract that I'm currently working on to sell an antique store's total inventory. Everywhere from furniture to Yadro to Crystal to Hummels and all that kind of stuff. But in our normal sales, we typically are toys and advertising and collectibles. If, if I could use a big word, it'd be collectibles. We try to stay away from your generic household items. And I say that they're bigger because, too. <laughs> well, they're, they're bigger. And, you know, let's say a dining room table. A dining room table is very out of favor right now. You know, millennials don't want a dining room table. They don't want grandma's china. They don't want that China hutch that's been sitting in your house for 50 years. So what, what they do want is Pokemon cards. Yeah. From their childhood or albums. And, and you make a great point. Most people nowadays collect what they knew as children. Yeah. The nostalgia factor, the nostalgia factor. And so for me, that means star Wars toys. That means GI Joe's. That means hot wheels. Again, that's what I like to collect. That's what I like to sell. Whereas my partner, Randy, he, he's, he's a quote unquote sinaholic. He loves the big RC cola signs and, and beer signs and, and gas and oil and mobile Pegasus signs and all that kind of stuff. The man cave items, the, the man cave items. Absolutely. And I, I know you've bought from us before. I have. You bought a bowling pin from us. If I remember correctly, I did that was signed by several different bowlers, Pro- professional bowlers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I bought some vinyl records too. And some vinyl records. That's my weak point. I love vinyl records. Well, who doesn't? It's true statements. You know, but vinyl has made a resurgence, right? Because it went from vinyl to cassettes to CDs. Yeah. But vinyl (laughs) has come back. It's amazing how much, you know, people are willing to pay for vinyl records nowadays. Yeah. Trends always seem to find their way back at some point in time, whether it be fashion, whether it be music, whether it's just, you never know what's going to be the next big thing. Right. I mean, Think about Beanie Babies. Oh, yeah. That went through the roof and then it dropped back down and it's slowly kind of getting somewhere. You'd be surprised. That's actually one of the things I sell at my booth at three or four or five dollars a piece. They don't take up much room. I put them in a bin and, you know, but the goal there is to sell them to the kids while mom shops. So it, it's it's all psychology there. But. You know, the Beanie Babies used to be two, three, four hundred dollars for some. Yeah. And all kinds of fights and stuff would break out. Then for a while, you could put them in a bag of like 50 and maybe get two dollars for them. Correct. And, and so it's it, it just just keeps that cycle going. But, you know, if I can buy a bag for five bucks and then I sell them for three, four five dollars a piece, I make money. It's all about learning how that system works. To be Absolutely. Able to kind of put out there. Now, when you're doing your auctions for your auction company, there are major different types of auction formats. Mm-hmm. Like you have your live in-person auction, you have your combo where you're doing simulcast, where you're selling live, but you're also selling it live online. So you're getting two bids at once. And then you also just have your online 
it's up here for a couple days and it closes out, whether it be all at once or every five minutes. How do you choose what's really gonna be in those two different types of auctions and what's really the advantages and disadvantages of the two? So we were lucky enough, we were doing, as you mentioned, a simulcast auction live and online at the same time up until November of 2020. Okay. That's when the world started to slowly shut down. Oh, no. That was, that was January, February of 2021. So we, we were smart enough, for some unknown reason. I think you was, being smart. I, I know, right? Um, Everybody gets one sometimes. Yeah. We, look, we sat down and we looked at it because we were taking the month of December off anyway. We always have because it's, nobody's interested in buying collectibles. They're interested in buying gifts. And At so Christmas time. We, we always take December off for the auction industry. And so, and it comes back big on January 1st. January 1st is a big auction day. But we sat down and we were evaluating our year and things like that. And we decided we would, we were doing simulcast. So what would happen is we might be running against somebody that same night that was only doing a live auction. Well, if you're only doing a live auction, you have to be there to bid. We were finding is we were having people that were at that other auctioneer's auction bidding on our items while we're doing the same thing. And then they come pick it up either that night or, or during pickup days. So we just decided at that point, what's the point in doing the live auction? Cause you have the over, you know, you have your clerks, you have your ringmen, you have your bid spotters, my kids holding up the items and somebody and selling concessions, little things like that. All that in, in labor adds up. So we decided to move to online only. So we sold all our chairs and all that kind of stuff before the end of the year. Well, then the pandemic hit. We were online only already. And so we had a competitive advantage at that point because other auctioneers in, in, in Jasper specifically were not selling online. So we just kept rolling. I mean, we never slowed down. We never did anything. We would schedule pickup time. So, you know, one or two people would be in at a time and so literally we just kept rolling and rolling and rolling and the other auctioneers were closed down for three, four five months until they could figure out what to do. And they eventually figured it out. But we just, like I said, we just kept rolling. We never had an issue or anything like that. And we just kept rolling forward. Yeah, and y'all offered shipping too on certain items to be able to, Hey, if it's a certain size, you can be able to ship it. And you were smart and they had to organize their shipping over certain sizes, correct? Or did you do, for certain sizes, hey, we'll 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 package it and ship it for you. We we typically ship everything in house. At the time, we did work with the UPS store in Canton to work out some logistics there. Anything that was really big or delicate, we would take to the UPS store, and then they would bill the customer directly. But eighty percent of what we shipped, we shipped internally, and that number has probably only gotten higher as we've gotten better at shipping. We we know how to ship from our eBay store that we've been doing for 20 years. So we know how to ship items. It's when we get into shipping a neon sign, for example. Yeah. That is massive. The size of like a wall in your house. <laughs> well, yeah. or no, I mean, I'm just talking about a, you know, 36 inch by 24 inch neon sign oh, that yeah, said, then... says Budweiser or yeah. something on it. And so got confused with the porcelain signs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so a, neon is very, 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 very delicate. I would never ship a neon sign, but Somebody in Kansas bought a neon sign. I said, sir, I am not shipping this to Kansas. I'll be happy to take it to the UPS store and have them ship it. Well, guess what? UPS store packaged it all up and it arrived broken. And then he's calling me trying to file a claim. I said, and I was like, sir, I, I didn't ship this. You know, you shipped it to yourself. You need to file a claim with UPS. And it, it took eight, nine phone calls for him to understand that he needed to talk to UPS and not me. But eventually, we, he finally got his money back because it arrived broken and all that kind of stuff. Which is unfortunate, but that's a risk when you're shipping that kind of item. Well, especially it was a 1960s Budweiser neon sign. I mean, yeah. it was gorgeous. It worked great, blah, blah, blah. But shipping it, I would never ship a neon sign. I remember taking one on consignment one time, and whenever it was brought in, the crate was massive. And it was like almost a foot and a half thick mm -hmm. with bubble wrap. And then on top of the bubble wrap, it had the, the uh, saran wrap to hold it in place there. And it just, it took me like an hour to get it fully unwrapped just to test it. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's, it's a 
crating and freighting is a skill unknown to everybody else. Indeed. And pinball machines too, because you've got all the inner workings on the inside. And if one little fuse gets moved, it's going to fall apart that way too. Absolutely. Yeah. All this, this, this thing that whenever it comes to shipping, it's very, very delicate. So something to think about everyone. Be thankful that if someone can ship it to you and get it on time and understand as well why it's so expensive at and, times. And the rates just keep going up. Yeah. Always buy the insurance. Always buy the insurance. That's my opinion. Well, we could talk about that a little bit later in, in, in we're talking about eBay. But when I purchase a label and I ship it via priority mail, it automatically has $100 worth of insurance on it. So depending on the price point, I may or may not add insurance on what I'm shipping. That's true. So it's one of those where you play the game. Understand, uh, yeah, understand the rules of the game to be able to play it. Since you mentioned eBay, that's going to transition to the eBay portion. Okay. How did you get started selling on eBay? Because that's another one of those different worlds. Well, one of the first things we did when we bought our, I mentioned we bought our first house, is my wife and I were sitting on that brand new desk that we had, had bought. For $60. And, yes. And we had our computer up and we were on eBay. My wife loves Faith Hill and Tim McGraw. Well, they were coming to town. And so we decided we were going to buy tickets off of eBay for Faith Hill and Tim McGraw. And so we're, have you heard of the term sniping, Kate? Oh yeah. That's a, a big, big word in the yeah. community of eBay. Yeah. So it's good and bad. <laughs> yes. Sniping is where you go in and you put in, at three, four, five seconds left, your max bid, trying to raise the price and, and get the item, and then nobody has a chance to come back against you. Which is why in our auctions online, if you bid in the last two minutes, it extends for two minutes. There's no sniping in order to protect the seller. It's protect the seller because, yeah, it may be sitting at 10 bucks right now, and it's a $50 item. Well, somebody puts in a snipe bid at three seconds left. Well, on eBay, it closes. Yeah, it okay. does in the set time. On our site, angrymamasauctions.highbid.com, it actually extends for two minutes. And then the person can come in and rebid again. And then they can just, they can start a battle, right? It may eventually end up at $50. Now, on eBay, it would sell for 10 On our site, it might sell for 50 What's better for the seller? That's true. That extra, that... Fifty dollars, that forty extra bucks, and it doesn't cost me anything extra for it to do that. I just sit there and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> watch it go. Thank yeah. you. Keep bidding. Keep bidding. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Now, how long have you been doing that? You said nineteen ninety nine. Was that kind of when you started? Well, or, so we were. Oh, you were buying. We were buying, that time. and we actually had to mail a check in. Ooh, money orders. Yeah, a money order. Yeah, in order to get the tickets. That's how long ago it was, and we were like. Well, this is kind of fun. And so after we moved to California and back, I was like, eh, I've gotten into the auction industry a little bit. I was dabbling my feet, you know, and I was like, well, you know, I need something to do besides just looking at my kid or, yeah, because I didn't have the second one yet. So we were, I was just, it was a little hobby. It's just a little hobby. I was, I'd go to an auction, I'd buy a thing here, buy a thing there, and then I'd sell it online. And this was my gig. And my wife, Natalie, said, any money you make off of it is yours. I'm like, okay. Cha-ching. <laughs> so I, I, I started buying a little bit more and buying a little bit more and selling a little bit more. And then finally, I, I went to her and I said, hey, I'm booking us a trip to Vegas with my proceeds. Ooh, that bet, bet you opened her eyes. Uh, yeah. She, she said, what? I said, yeah, I've, I've made enough. I'd like us to go to Vegas. It's not going to cost us anything. I've, I've made all this extra money. And she goes, huh. Wheels start to turn. The wheels started to turn. And then therefore there went my play money. I, I lost it all after that point. She, she decided that, yeah, no, that's no longer play money. If, if it's making that much. And when you're starting to get a 1099 form from eBay or PayPal, it's not a hobby anymore. It's That's a true. You've now yeah reached that next level. You've reached that next level. So it just it just really took off from there. So I, I started, and I would recommend this to anybody that's starting on eBay: sell items in your home first. Sell what you have. Sell items you that are collectible or 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 something along those lines. 
You don't have to go out and invest $500 buying inventory on stuff you don't know if it's going to sell or not. Sell what you know. Sell what you know. Sell, sell, you know, the vintage Coca-Cola bottle you got from your grandmother or, you know, whatever it is to then make the money to then go buy other stuff. So you could actually start this business without any capital involvement. The, the second thing I would say is buy off eBay. I uh, find something that's selling low that you know you could be able to sell higher. You got to get your ratings up. Oh, that's true. Yeah, because that goes a long way. The, the different stars. You, your different stars. I'm not going to buy from a seller that's got four stars. I'm going to buy from the person that's got 4,000 stars with a good track record of feedback. And so that that's just how it is for me. That's what I would recommend because you're not investing any of your money. You know, if you're going to have a garage sale, but you've got some good stuff in there, put it up on, if you've got a Nike sweatshirt hoodie, that's never been worn because your kid grew out of it so fast, put it up on eBay. It'll sell. It'll sell for more than what you'll get in the garage sale. You're the, seeing more people. You're, you're yeah. see, your eyes are out there on more people. And I sell internationally. I've shipped to, I don't know how many countries. And we used to do it directly. Now we only do it through eBay's global shipping program. But yeah, it used to be, we'd ship to Italy or we'd ship to Russia or we'd ship to Taiwan or anywhere like that. Yeah, that's smart to be able to, the international shipping program kind of provides you that extra layer of protection too. Oh, it's it's absolutely a protection. And I'll give a, a great example. He had my... Under eBay's global shipping program, my job is to get it to Kentucky. Okay. They are then supposed to unbox the item, look at it, make sure it's good, rebox it, and then send it to the buyer in, let's say, France. Well, we had a die cast car. It was a $300 die cast car. We shipped it to Kentucky. They shipped it on. Customer claims it arrived, damaged, whatever. eBay's global shipping program says, they got the claim, not a problem. They refunded the customer's money and I kept my money because they had said it was their issue because they had seen it, they checked it off and it was good to go. It's like the UPS store whenever you had that in-between barrier. Correct. Yeah. That's smart. Now you mentioned saying, you know, start off with your own inventory that you have, no capital start here. You sell certain stuff like man cave things and stuff like that in your auction house. What do you sell at your eBay store? In my eBay store, a lot of the exact same things. I've got about 960 items currently on eBay. And the majority of that is going to be toys. Toys, toys, toys. I recently got a monster model collection. It was a referral from an auctioneer because they didn't have a chance, you know, they didn't have time to go and, and deal with it. It, was, it wasn't in their realm they they do more of industrial liquidations and things like that but they'd gotten a call because that was in their town and so lady called me and said yeah i've got a model collection my husband passed away and, and you know I, I need to to sell it and i'm like okay it was in lawrenceville and i happened to be in loganville at the time right next door right next door and so and i had my van which because my son owns a delivery business and he and i were delivering a piece of furniture for him and so I said, well, ma'am, I'm in the area. Can I come go ahead and come on over? And she goes, yeah, sure. Come on. Well, when you say model collection, you know, you don't think of a very big collection, right? You think of, you know, maybe they got 10, 15 models. Not a big deal. No, no, no. No Cade. She filled up my entire cargo van. Can you be able to see out the back window? No, because I don't have a back window. Oh, that's but, true. I forgot. But yeah, I mean, it literally... I had to strategically place items in order to get it all in there. And this is why mom and dad, we played Tetris at a young age because we needed that skill later on in life. That's actually my son's, one of my son's favorite games. And so he was helping me with it, place it all and all that. And so we, we, we bought the collection, my son and I, and he helped me load it. And, and so we brought it home and, and at first I was thinking, well, let's put some in the auction and, and all that kind of stuff. And then I was like, no. We're going to do all on eBay. And so we probably bought that in June. We are, no, in May, we are still listing models off of that collection. Oh, because, my word. Because wow. some, some of them were duplicates. But, I mean, there was 1960s Aurora King Kong with a glow-in-the-dark head models on it. 
you know, those are $200 models. And so, I mean, we're just going through and going through and going through. And luckily within 30 days, I had all my money back plus some. Dang, that's, that's impressive. And we're still listing and we're still listing. And so, um, I sell toys. That's, that's what I like. That's what I like to sell. I've got over 200 followers on eBay that just follow my listings. And when I post something, they get a new email and, and we sell, we've sold over 14,000 items since we started on eBay. That's intense. And that's going on. What you study like close to like 20 years, close to 20 years. Yeah. And, and, and some of that has, you know, some years we haven't done all that much, but when we lived in Delaware, one of the, one of the best things we did, or I, my job at the time for Honda was I was a rep. And so on the motorcycle side for the finance division, I hope that makes sense. It does. So I would go and visit dealers, motorcycle dealers in my territory, which was from Virginia to Maine. It's big space, big space. I had over 200 dealers. I would go visit them. And so every week I was on the road, I'd leave out either Monday or Tuesday, come back Friday. And so depending on where I'd easily do a thousand miles a week on the road. Well, what are you going to do in a town when you don't know anybody? Let's say you're in college station, Pennsylvania, or, or, you know, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or something like that. Well, John would look on auctionzip.com, find an auction for each night of what city I would be in or in that area, or that would dictate on what order I would kind of plan my route. And so I would come home at the end of the week with a full car of inventory that my wife would then put on eBay the next week while I was gone again. So you have a system now going on at this point. We had a, we had a total system. And just last night I was talking with my kids and my son can remember the layout of the post office in Delaware because he had to go in it so many times. <laughs> and one of the best things we I did was I went to a Hallmark or it was an auction, but they had a Hallmark ornaments. Okay. Good niche market there as well. Very niche market, but I was buying them by the flat and by flat. I mean, if you think about a 24 pack of Coca-Cola saran bar- wrapped together and n- not the, saran, the, the cardboard box that they would come in is what we call a flat. And so they would just have multiple 15, 20 ornaments and I'm paying 15, $20 a flat. And I just took them all, took them all. Each time they'd bring them up, I'd, I'd buy the flat. They'd, they bring up, let's say 10 flats at a time. Somebody might spend $70 on one flat and then they sell the rest at $10, $15 and I just take them all. I had a whole, my, my Honda Pilot was completely full of Hallmark ornaments. That's a small car too, the Honda Pilot. That's, that's not a big one. I mean, it's an SUV. Yeah, but still in comparison to your cargo van. Correct. And so, I mean, it was chock full. And so <laughs> my oldest son at, I don't remember how old he was. Let's say that's, say that was 2012, I believe. He was like 10 years old, Right. I paid him to open up the ornaments, take the ornament out and put it on top of the box so that my wife could then go through and just take pictures and keep rolling and keep rolling. We would, we would sell 10 ornaments a night. Wow. That's intense. Oh, it was very intense. I don't have any of them left. That's a good thing. That is, that is an amazing thing. Yeah. So, I mean, if you can buy in bulk like that, it helps your overall proceeds and if you're buying the same item 10 times you just take a picture of once and set it up and go times 10 like kind of do whatever it's going the line so you don't have to write the same listing every single time for the same item so let's talk a little bit about listing though Cade. yeah you know what we're going to do here we're going to transition to listing is the next portion we're going to pause this episode in one week from now we're going to have the second part of the episode being starting with eBay listings and we'll also talk about his booth. So come back and talk and visit us the next next week instead of being two weeks apart and we can be able to pick up where we left off with John. Let's keep rolling with this thing and continue sharing some great knowledge here. This is exciting. So as you listeners know, my lovely catch line we've got going on here to end off an episode is thank you for listening to us. Thanks for coming in. You can follow me on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter. It's at Learning From Friends Podcast. You can email me at Cade at learningfromfriends.com. That's spelled C-A-D-E. And most of all, as you leave today, don't forget to let your curiosity 
fly high. Um.